you guys hear me? Hola, buenos dias a todos. Que tal estamos? Oh, wait, they're telling me I gotta do this in English. Okay, how are you guys today? I'm so excited to be here. I hope you are uh, as well. Um, I'm Gabriel Colombro. Um, if you guys were expecting Jim, sorry, you got me today. Um, we have a super exciting program this week. Uh, uh, I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, so before we get started with our program, I have a few housekeeping announcements uh, that I'm going to go through, uh, and then we can get started. So first of all, I want to thank you, our, thank our uh, Diamond sponsor uh, for the conference. Uh, thank you to Google, uh, Fujitsu, and our friends at Open Euler. Uh, uh, we really appreciate your support. We couldn't be doing this without you. Um, as well as our platinum sponsor for the conference. It's uh, really great to be in this amazing venue. And again, this wouldn't be possible with all of our sponsors. Um, so thank you so much uh, to everyone uh, who sponsored the conference. Um, I also want to send a shout out to our program committee. Uh, uh, if you like the program throughout the week, uh, it's because uh, they've done an amazing job reviewing the content. Uh, a big shout out to the chairs. Uh, so uh, uh, we're really, really thankful. Uh, this is a community effort, uh, and we couldn't be doing it without our chairs. Then, a couple of uh, 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 housekeeping notes for you to uh, enjoy the conference and make the most of it. Uh, our sponsor showcase uh, is on floor zero. Uh, it opens daily. Uh, 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 at the end of the keynotes, uh, and that's where the coffee breaks are. So, you know, you got a good excuse to be uh, uh, alive and caffeinated there. And we also have arcade games, hallway track. Generally, the hallway track is the most valuable track of the conference. So I hope you guys will, will show up there. Um, you got your badge, some information in your badge, your Wi-Fi password, and uh, you got your schedule. Uh, uh, in the back of your badge, and you got signage throughout the whole uh, venue. Uh, and then a couple of things that I'd like you not to miss out. We have a woman and non-binary open source lunch. There's no registration required, uh, and it's open to all attendees who identify as women or non-binary. Uh, and then one of my favorite parts is the Ask the Expert sessions. Um, you know, when I was a new contributor, I really enjoyed you know, being able to ask questions directly uh, to some of the uh, experts uh, in all the projects that are represented here today. So uh, the ex as the expert sessions are located in the sponsor showcase, uh, floor zero, uh, and the sessions start at 3.10 today. Last but not least, uh, uh, at the end of the day, we're going to have a reception, a huge thank you. This is sponsored by Docker. Uh, the reception is at San Mames Stadium. I'm actually really excited to go, to go there. Whenever I think about San Mames, I think about my football team losing at San Mames. So I'm actually excited to go there for a fun event. Uh, don't forget to bring your badge. It's going to be needed to get into the event. And then, uh, very important, all of our events uh, uh, are supposed to be inclusive and everyone should feel welcome. Um, so make sure you treat everyone with respect uh, uh, and sort of inherent worth. Um, if there is any issues and you have any concerns, please go to registration on floor one uh, uh, or at the info desk at the sponsor showcase on floor zero and the fantastic Linux Foundation event team will be able to help you. And with that, I think we are done with the uh, uh, housekeeping, so I'm going to get started. We have a fantastic program today, um, but before we start, um, some of you, how many of you were at Open Source Summit last year? Huh, good amount. So last year we launched uh, Linux Foundation Europe, uh, which I happen to uh, have the honor to lead. Um, it's a European entity based in Brussels. It's been a pretty busy year. We had our first member summit yesterday. And so before I just jump into 
the, the programming, I just want to send a shout out to the almost 150 organizations who have uh, um, really supported us, really validating the idea that while open source is global, there are certain priorities in Europe that we can really focus on and collaborate together. So uh, once again, thank you so much. And I'm so honored to be here uh, uh, leading the Open Source Summit. Uh, um, hopefully, I'll, I'll fill some big shoes, uh, jeans shoes. Um, so uh, before we get started with the program, I want to uh, try to tee up some of the key themes that you're going to see from the, in the next few days. Um, we have some exciting announcements, uh, you know, and, and some of the content is really tailored towards, uh, you know, our experience in Europe in the last year and, and some of the lessons that we learned. So first and foremost, um, and I might be biased here, uh, besides running Linux Foundation Europe, I uh, am the executive director of a foundation called Finos, FinTech Open Source Foundation. Who knew that you could actually get banks to collaborate in open source? Uh, something, uh, you know, probably 10 years ago, I wouldn't have uh, bet on. Um, but we are seeing increasing focus from each industry undergoing the digital transformation. They really understand how open source uh, is, a, is a core pillar, is a core uh, accelerator for uh, digital transform. And so we'll, we'll talk about it a, a lot today. Um, on the other hand, you know, I think there is a strong relationship uh, between open source and the public sector. We're seeing a lot of engagement, a lot of push uh, for open source consumption and for open source as a, a driver for the digital uh, transformation of the public sector um, and digital sovereignty. Um, that said, it's still a complicated relationship and we're going to develop this theme uh, throughout today and the next couple of days. Um, Open governance. Um, I think you all know what open source is, and I think you all know uh, uh, what open governance means. Uh, that said, outside of the open source eco chamber, sometimes there is some confusion as to you know, what uh, a foundation can bring to the table in terms of making sure that all the different constituents can collaborate together. So we'll have some exciting announcements uh, on this in the next uh, uh, actually today and tomorrow. And then, this is one that is near and dear to my heart, and there's actually two themes here. Uh, you probably heard uh, about the push for open source sustainability, not only open source security, but how we support maintainers. Uh, but this year, we've seen a lot of advancements in how open source can drive uh, the world sustainability, uh, helping solve some of the most pressing challenges uh, out there, whether it be climate change, whether it be uh, um, uh, rare sort of extinction of, of uh, 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 species. Uh, this is, I think, something that not always we realize, uh, but open source has a huge, open collaboration more broadly, has a huge power, um, and you all have it. And then last but not least, you would not be surprised uh, in 2023, the year of AI, uh, there's going to be a lot of talk of, uh, uh, at the intersection of open source and AI, and how open source has really throughout the year uh, accelerated both the democratization and just plainly the innovation that is happening in AI. So I hope uh, you find this exciting, and I'm going to get started with our first uh, uh, um, theme for the day. So, as I said, I might be biased because I worked uh, for now six years um, on a foundation bringing banks together, but all of you may be quite familiar with some of the most uh, uh, sort of famous projects in the Linux Foundation. Linux itself, Kubernetes, uh, Maybe less of you are familiar with the fact that we have very much a foundation that supports every industry to collaborate. Uh, LF Networking focuses on the telco industry. We have automotive-grade Linux for the automotive industry. Uh, we actually have uh, a, a project, the Academy Software Foundation, that focuses on the film industry. Um, of course, Finos on the financial services side. 
LF Energy for the energy sector. But we even have highly regulated industries like insurance. OpenIDL is a blockchain-based uh, exchange of insurance data. And last but not least, agriculture. So uh, we are seeing this trend continue to develop in the last few years. And what I've uh, learned uh, as an Italian living in California, but now you know, back in Europe for Linux Foundation Europe, unsurprisingly, a lot of these foundations have a strong footprint in, in Europe. Europe has uh, so many leading organizations uh, in all of these verticals, and so we are seeing a lot of acceleration uh, in this area. Um, and I think this is going to continue. Uh, we're going to see more and more industries. As every industry becomes digitally native. They, cannot, they simply cannot do it without open source. Um, but don't trust me, don't trust an Italian uh, uh, on this. We <laughs> luckily have data. And so I want to start with our first announcement. Um, if you were in Dublin last year, we unveiled our first uh, uh, World of Open Source survey with a focus on Europe. Today, we are announcing our World of Open Source Europe Spotlight 2023 which is a survey focused on the advancement of open source, specifically in Europe. Um, I'm not going to go through every single finding, but you got the QR code there. You can download the report. It's free. The data set, as usual, is open. I'd love to see if you guys can come up with some super interesting findings out of this uh, uh, survey. And we also have a deep dive tomorrow uh, uh, at 2.20 PM. We have a fantastic panel that is going to dive deeper into the findings, where you can understand both how individual contributors, the public sector, and of course, enterprises are uh, seeing increased value in open source. So I'm going to give you just a quick spoiler uh, before we tee up our first uh, guest speakers. Uh, you would not be surprised to see that in Europe, uh, at this point, the business value of open source. So we all know, we're all familiar with, you know, as, as open source contributors, uh, we know what, what brings us towards open source. Uh, but it's certainly great to see that more and more in corporate environments, the business value of open source is well understood. To the point that over half of respondents, if you look at year on year, uh, they state uh, that there is growth in the value that they're seeing in open source for their organization. And this is actually across all respondents, organizations, public sector, uh, and individuals. Um, up to the level that 91% of the respondents is saying that open source is vital, it's critical to the development of their industry. And this is honestly not surprising. If you followed the advancement in AI, uh, and how critical open source has been to uh, the innovation that is coming uh, and the really revolution that is coming through AI in every single aspect of our personal life and businesses. Uh, this is only accelerating the pressure to have an open source strategy, to engage in open source community, to support uh, upstream uh, projects. Um, you know, you'd not be surprised to see that if you exclude big tech or high tech, every other industry is expected to see uh, uh, from 2 to 5% of the revenue changed and evolved and grown uh, by the impact of AI. So in fact, AI is only accelerating the pressure for these, in these industries to innovate, how they very much do open source, uh, and more generally, how they are digitally native. And so uh, as we... <laughs> Uh, start with this first theme around vertical industries. I am super excited to bring on stage uh, Harpit Yoshipura. He is the general manager of networking, edge, and IoT and energy at the Linux Foundation with a couple of distinguished guests. Thank you, Harpit. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. All right. Thank you. And uh, we have some exciting news today. Uh, but more importantly, we're going to talk about industries and verticals that Gabe said that are 100 years old. And uh, I'll just get the clicker. But 100-year-old industries 
that historically always relied on proprietary hardware and, and software. So these are telecommunications, energy, banking, automotive, right? And to accelerate the speed of innovation, it has moved to open source. I call it open sourceification, which is fantastic. And so uh, before we get to the news, I want to set the context, right? Uh, this is how you are all connected in the world globally, okay? You have, we have three major sub-foundations within the Linux Foundation, LF Connectivity, uh, which uh, addresses all the rural and dense connectivity, plus there is ORAN uh, software community that addresses the mobile uh, connectivity that you all are sort of checking the phones right now. And then um, we have LF Edge, which is a huge market for edge computing, which is four times the size of cloud computing. And we have projects in edge computing across IoT, cloud, telecom, and enterprise edge. And then on the core and the cloud side, on the right-hand side, you have the entire stack from network operating systems to data plane, control plane, and applications. And the great news is um, we have projects that are deployed in the world today running open source software, right? Very proud of that. The more important part is 80% of the top 10 CapEx spender globally participate in LF networking today. And we have two of them here on the stage today, uh, Deutsche Telekom and Orange, that uh, represent you know, a big chunk of open source adoption. And so they're gonna talk about two very critical projects and an announcement. So first of all, let's uh, uh, hand it over to Nicholas, who's the Director of Strategy and Transformation at Orange, to talk about Silva. Thank you, Arpit. Hello, everybody. So I'm going to talk about Silva. And basically, Silva does two things. Number one, we deliver a cloud-native production-grade stack that is aiming at ad addressing the telco and edge use cases. The funny thing is, the more we talk with other verticals, the more we see that it's not only for telco. So it's really broader than that. Um, for me, it's important to say that Silva does not reinvent the wheel. We integrate open source components that are already present in the ecosystem, like the CNCF, for instance. And we implement specifications that are drafty, drafted by other entities, like the, the Anuket reference architecture. Second, the validation centers. The Silva stack is delivered and then we install it in validation centers and we invite providers to test the behavior of their workloads on top of the stack to validate it. So in terms of progress, where are we? It's not even been a year since the launch of the project and we already have published and released two versions of the stack, including the bare metal one. We have two validation centers up and running and we have a very active community. Since the launch with the founding members, we more than doubled the number of active participants. And now, thanks to the launch of the directed fund, we have the means to accelerate the delivery of the project and reinforce this community. So we're here in Bilbao. Come and talk to us, join the project, join the fund. We are present at several booths, the Linux Foundation Europe booth, the SUSE booth, the Huawei booth. So come and see us and try to keep in mind our motto, every cloud deserves a silver lining. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. you great, great progress and thank you for the announcement. Uh, next up is Marcus, who is the program manager of Machanta API and the Kamara Foundation from Deutsche Telekom. Take it on. So good morning from my side also. Um, I could not imagine when initiating Kamara two and a half years ago with others, that today I will be on stage here telling you that we already have grown to more than 750 people from more than 250 companies all over the globe. And on top, um, that Linux Foundation, that the GSMA and Team Forum have signed a white paper dedicating Camara to be the organization on this planet to define the APIs the interface between telco industry and the customers. That is really fantastic success for us. And for that, I'm really happy now to announce that we go to the next level. Um, we are initiating a Camara Front project and already have won 15 sponsors for that. So that helps us to be a real reliant partner for the whole industry. 
Thank you. Good job. And 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 as you can see, um, you know, this is this is a way of monetizing the rich data that exists in the network today and uh, allowing things like AI to run on top of that. So very good progress on these two fronts. We're also announcing that um, Linux Foundation is expanding the partnership with Etsy uh, and expanding its collaboration for projects like Nephio, projects like Kamara, and the press release is out right now. Uh, but again, everything thanks to the dedication and support from the EU community along with the global community. So really excited about that. Thank you very much for, for the announcement. And one final thing, um, for those of you who know the Open Networking Summit, if you remember 10 years ago, we launched it in Silicon Valley with Stanford. It's back in Silicon Valley next year. Uh, save the date. We hope to see as many of you as possible. Uh, we're going to talk about all the innovation coming up in the entire uh, networking sector, edge sector, and the AI implications on that right from the heart of Silicon Valley. So with that, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to our guests uh, for these awesome announcements. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Great stuff. Wow. Um, we're off to a great start, I think. Um, I'm really excited to see um, industries investing in open source. Honestly, when I started, um, that wasn't really the case. So um, now I'm going to have to move to our next theme uh, for the day, which we're going to start today and continue developing throughout, throughout the week. Um, as I said, um, you're probably familiar with the critical role that open source plays in the public sector, not just as consumption. Many countries in Europe uh, promote open source usage, uh, sometimes uh, open source unless type policies. I, I spent my early days of, of open source contribution in Holland uh, in 2005, 2006, and they were already betting on open source. But especially the European Union has been pushing open source um, you know, as a, a really strong driver for achieving digital sovereignty and the digital commons. Um, and that's what we've seen already in the survey last year. Uh, this is a result from last year's open source spotlight. Um, and we seem to see a common trend here. On one hand, there is a strong strategic uh, sort of messaging a statement towards uh, uh, the critical nature of open source for the public sector. Uh, on the other hand, we see a gap between sort of uh, consumption and contribution. There seems to be uh, a little bit of a disconnect that doesn't allow the public sector to fully capitalize, whether it is at in national government's level or, or EU level, to fully capitalize on open source. And the results this year uh, seem to sort of confirm that. Um, I touched before, I think a clear understanding is, is coming in the community that open source can really help uh, social impact uh, and can really help solving some of the world's most pressing challenges like climate change, social inequality. Um, but once again, this year we found in the survey that the value, the perceived value of open source in the public sector has somewhat stagnated. Uh, it seems that, you know, while we continue to see more individual contributors, we continue to see more industries investing in open source, um, the public sector is moving more slowly. Uh, there seems to be a disconnect. And so today, uh, uh, I need to talk uh, about something that is um, really important on a more serious note. Um, can I ask a question? How many of you are familiar with the Cyber Resiliency Act? Oh, that's a good number. Hopefully, by the end of today, it's going to be an even higher number. But um, the Cyber Resilience Act is one of the many uh, regulations that are coming down from the EU regulating software. Um, and while I think it's important to say that the goals are absolutely worthy, uh, you know, bolstering the, the cyber security uh, uh, as a national security issue or a, a EU-wide security issue, 
uh, there seem to be some fundamental misconception in the current draft of the regulation. Uh, it is not effective yet, it's entering into trilogues. For those of you who are more familiar with the Brussels legislative process, um, there are a couple of, of important disconnects there. Uh, on one hand, it seems that the goals that are very worthy are uh, not necessarily uh, properly implemented, and they actually risk to impact open source uh, pretty heavily the way we know it. Um, even further, uh, we, po we published a, a post from Mirko Bohm, who's uh, our uh, Linux Foundation Europe uh, uh, Senior Director of Community Development and an economist, a sort of very well renowned uh, open source expert in Europe. This might even actually undermine the very goals of the EU of digital sovereignty, because it does impact uh, the open source ecosystem as we know it. Um, last but not least, critical constituents like uh, individual contributors and foundations have not been first-class citizens in this conversation. Um, earlier in the year, uh, we published an open letter with the major other open source foundations, the Apache Software Foundation, Eclipse, uh, Open Forum Europe, and several other organizations in Europe. Um, just for context, this is what happened last week on the other side of the pond. And again, bear in mind, I never really had the American dream. I live in California, but I, that's not where I sort of saw myself ending there. Um, but last week, the, world, the White House called OpenSSF and some other foundations to really uh, provide input on how we all together uh, bolster cybersecurity. Uh, open source and, and cybersecurity, they go hand in hand, um, and we've not seen the same approach here in Europe. So I want to be very specific, because this is an area where we will need your help. Um, the CRA as is has the chance to truly upend the, the value exchange as we know it, the open value exchange that happened in open source communities. Um, Open source has always been provided for the benefit of users, as is. And the CRA, the way it's drafted right now, it does put liability on upstream developers and foundations. And there's been many calls for change over the last year, uh, but we have not seen substantial changes in the CRA that is now entering its uh, you know, final legislative phase with the trilogues and then the plenary. So what does that mean? Uh, there's very much a chance that in order to uh, uh, prevent liability, uh, open source projects could be blocked for downloads into the EU or you know, being published with a disclaimer, not approved for use in the EU. And I mean, I used to be a release manager, and if at a certain point my build starts breaking because my upstream dependencies all of a sudden are not available, trust me, I'd be quite pissed. Um, so what we are asking today is for everyone to speak up. This is going to potentially impact open source as the beautiful thing that we've all been used to rely on. So we're launching today our Fix the CRA campaign, um, we got stickers at our uh, Linux Foundation Europe booth, but that's more than that. We need you to speak up and, first of all, educate yourself. We have a panel on Thursday, uh, uh, which is going to go much deeper than I can in the limited amount of time that I have. Uh, but also, we published, if you go to linuxfoundation.eu slash Cyber Resilience Act, you have a compendium of all the opinions and thoughts that all the foundations and all the different constituencies have put together. If you see that on the left, those are very much commercial organizations and associations that are putting statement of concern when it comes to the CRA. So whether you are an individual on the left side or I guess right side, well, whatever, for developers, uh, or whether you are uh, a representative of an organization that maybe has a public affairs department, get involved today. Uh, these two QR codes link to 
click to tweet. We try to make it super easy for you to be engaged and be vocal about it. But you can also go to the web page, and there's going to be a form when you can get in touch. We are trying to work with all of our community, all the different constituencies, to make sure that we protect open source in the EU the way we know it. I thank you in advance for that. Now, um, besides calling for action to our community, uh, we understand that our role is to continue educating uh, the community. And so this year, uh, based on really the major opportunity that we've seen through Linux Foundation Europe for better engagement of the public sector, uh, we are announcing another report um, that really uh, surveyed uh, some of the most, uh, um, ex the biggest experts in open source in Europe, from maintainers uh, to policy experts to uh, corporate open source uh, contributors. Uh, that really goes deep into the opportunities and clearly challenges of public sector engagement in open source. Uh, you know, I personally think there is a huge opportunity in Europe for bringing together public and private sector in, in truly investing in open source, uh, in sustainability of open source, in making sure that there is a fair balance uh, between consumption and contribution. So, once again, QR code, you can download it, the data set is open. Um, I'm not going to go again through all of it today, but I will go deeper on it on Thursday during the Linux Foundation Europe uh, specific update. Um, but I'll leave you with one finding that probably is not going to surprise you. Um, according to our interviews, interviewees, um, open source is still a very strong driver for digital sovereignty. Uh, Europe has a huge opportunity through open source uh, to plot its, its digital future. Um, on the other hand, and that's one of the reasons why Linux Foundation Europe was very much created, um, digital sovereignty doesn't mean techno-nationalism, doesn't mean balkanization of open source. And so there has been a really broad call uh, from all the experts in Europe to make sure that uh, we foster digital sovereignty but without fostering additional division in open source. Let's keep open source global. I really appreciate you taking action on this, and with that, that's the end of my first presentation. Thank you.